Good morning, neighbors. This is Long John with the party line. We're around from midnight to 5.30, six mornings during the week. Monday mornings, we get started about 1, continue through till 5.30. And that means we're around for about 37 and a half hours each and every week. During that time, I have the pleasure of talking with many interesting people. And we talk about a lot of offbeat subjects. In fact, tomorrow night, or rather tonight at midnight, because we're into Saturday morning already, understand we'll be having a group of ladies up here. Uh, followers of a famous yogi, and uh, he will go in trance, and we will have a seance. I'm just wondering whether Jack Keene will show that morning. We'll find out, though. Well, let's not talk about what's going to be happening Sunday morning. Let's talk about what's going to be happening today, Saturday morning. We're going to be talking with Otis T. Carr and Norman Colton of OTC Enterprises Incorporated of Baltimore, Maryland. We have talked about these gentlemen many times, and we have talked with them many times, and we've discussed the circular craft. At the moment, I'm just ad-libbing this. I forget the technical name. The circular foil craft, that was it. And here's the flight plan of the OTC X1 on Operation Moon. Take off at 12:01 a.m. the 7th day of December 1959. The craft will depart from Space Maryland in a vertical rise and beginning orbit of the Earth at a speed of 5000 miles per hour. Now this is just one little idea of what's going to happen. And, of course, we've been told the pilot will be Otis T. Carr, the navigator Major Wayne Ahole of Washington, D.C. Now, I know that for a moment some people that possibly are tuning in for the very first time to the party line, they say, what goes? What is this, science fiction? Gee, frankly, I don't know what it is. I can only say this, that I have in front of me a mock-up of the spacecraft, and we're going to be talking about that. We'll give you a description of it. I have the gentleman seated around the table, and with all of that, we should have uh, something that uh, will prove to be of interest to all of our listeners. Ben with the cybernetician, will be with us in a couple of minutes. Ellery Lanier is with us, author of the book entitled A Manual of Real Magic, and Lester Del Rey author of Rockets Through Space, will arrive about 2 or 2.30 this morning. He's attending a science fiction convention, I understand, in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. And uh, just as soon as he can get back, he'll be here because he's very excited about the opportunity of talking to these gentlemen. And you may not buy any of this. I don't myself. But I'll tell you one thing. It's wonderful listening, and who knows? Maybe they'll be going to the moon the 7th day of December, 1959. Otis T. Carr, Norman Colton, Ellery Lanier, Ben Iskwith, and Lester Del Rey. Hey, Chris. Mr. Carr, first of all, we welcome you back to the party line, and we certainly are very excited to know more about this uh, trip to the moon. I understand the takeoff will be at 12.01 a.m., the 7th day of December, 1959. You really think that you'll take off? Good evening, uh, Long John. We're happy to be here. We really think we will take off. Uh, maybe not right at 12.01, but on the 7th of December, 1959, early in the morning. Why would there be a delay? Why would you take off at 12.30 or 1 o'clock? Well, we understand that uh, some space people have advised us to make a little bit later departure on this date. Space people? Are you are you talking about the people connected with Cape Canaveral? Or are you talking about Venusians or Martians? Which? We don't know whether they're Martians or Venusians, but some very kind friends told us that they had received a message from outer space telling us that the Magnetic fields would be much more favorable if we made our departure about two hours later. Well, Mr. Carr, after listening to that statement, I'm certainly going to have a, a number of questions. 
Do you mean to sit here, sir, as an alleged scientist, as a designer, as an inventor, and tell me that O.C. Carr, the president of O.C.C. Enterprises, would be guided by metaphysicians, by people claiming that they're receiving messages, telepathically, evidently, communications from Venus and Mars. As a scientist, would you permit these things to sort of sway your mind? Uh, the first thing that a scientist does is investigate reports. We don't know whether this is true or not, but we have well over a year to have other events come up that may make it worth considering. Uh, we certainly plan to leave on December 7th, 1959. We hope it is 12.01 a.m. If sufficient evidence, evidence is given to us to make it later, we will certainly investigate it. I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of leaving a little later. I mean, Not at all. We won't ridicule you, believe me. If you get off at 12.30 or 1 o'clock, <laughs> we'll talk about it. I believe this is too. <laughs> Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Carr. Uh, did you say that the messages that you received or people associated with you have been receiving these telepathic communications, uh, did you make the statement that uh, the warning was that there are other magnetic fields that may disturb the possible takeoff? This was the information that was handed to us unsolicited by us. We mentioned it because by the time we're ready to take off, evidence may be in this direction. What do you mean by other magnetic fields? How many magnetic fields do you know of at the present time, Mr. Carr? We only know of the one that we're working in. And do you feel that there's something to this message? Not a thing at the present moment. Not a thing at the present moment. Right. Well, is the implication then that around the first week in December in the year of 1959 that we may discover a new magnetic field? We may discover new forces in this field. New discoveries are coming up all the time. Could you elaborate on that? What do you mean uh, by new forces, Mr. Carr? New understanding of the forces. Uh, this is a matter of discovery. It's like the space age. We have always had the space age, John, but the um, consciousness of people are just beginning to understand that there is such an age. So we may have new understandings about magnetic fields within a year from now. You're insisting on, on, on making that word field plural. Right. It's field, not right. field. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Carr, there's one thing that I have noticed during the past year, and I think it, I think it has been almost a year since your first appearance, maybe a little less, but we've talked to you two or three times. I've also met you, uh, well, one day we talked at the space convention that was held in New Jersey. That's right. Beautiful and, day. Yes, it was. Let's not discuss the convention. The day, I agree with you, was beautiful, sir. Uh, the very first time that we had the pleasure of talking to you, Mr. Carr, over the WOR mics, uh, I was impressed in a way. I didn't believe the story. I didn't buy it. But very frankly, I was impressed with the literature and the... Uh, the mock-ups and the different uh, models that you brought to the studio here. But during the past year, in talking to you on two or three other occasions, I have a, a feeling that uh, you, you seem to be getting involved in metaphysics, in the occult. In other words, you're bringing a little mysticism into something that originally you presented as uh, something that you considered to be scientific. We consider all of our work to be discovery, 
to be scientific, although we claim not to be a scientist, we are a true investigator of nature. There is nothing wrong with mysticism. Mysticism is not mystery. It is knowledge gained by a past. Uh, we have had some training in these fields and that have been of great help to us in the further development of our enterprise. We might state that Benjamin Franklin, uh, that uh, Faraday, that Francis Bacon were mystics. And I think that what they left to the world, they may not have gone to MIT, but I do believe they left something lasting to the world. Is this the Bacon that wrote the Shakespeare? Well, this is what many people claim that he did, Francis Bacon. What do you think about that, Mr. Cox? I know that he wrote Nova Morganum, which an advancement in learning which we feel is the yardstick of all discoveries of science today. He was one of the most profound people that ever lived on this planet in our recorded history. Uh, he was a mystic. In the same sense, so am I. I make no classification of the relationship with my achievement. But I am the same type of a mystic that Michael Faraday was or Benjamin Franklin or... I wonder if you'd be kind enough, Mr. Carr, to define the word mystic as you're employing it this morning. In other words, you're telling me that that you're a mystic like Benjamin Franklin, like Bacon. Uh, to be very honest with you, I, frankly, am not familiar enough with their lives to be able to understand how you're using the word mystic. Could you tell me why you consider yourself to be a mystic and what is mystical about you? Uh, only that we follow a path of learning. All have followed the same path. This goes back into recorded history. It is a, a, an approach to true knowledge. And what is metaphysical many times today becomes physical ten years from now. The mystic explores the potentiality of all things rather than just purely the physical as he sees it. Now, in this sense, we are a true mystic. The uh, definition is well given in any dictionary but with, uh, or any encyclopedia, and you'll find out that it does not mean mystery or mysterious. Uh, I, my thoughts are far away from giving you a true definition except as I have outlined it here but if any of your uh, staff want to come up with an encyclopedia, you'll find what we have stated is correct. Uh, insofar as science is concerned, this is an approach to nature. And we have followed some natural laws rather than unnatural ones to make it possible for us to confidently state that we have a principle that will bring man into space, into exploration of space travel, and return safely, and that we can do this within a year. A moment ago, <clears throat> you uh, described uh, Bacon as being one of the most profound men that ever lived on this planet. Was there an implication in that uh, statement that there are people living on other planets we confidently feel that there are. We cannot possibly conceive of a vast number of suns and planets revolving around them without light. Uh, we can go into the desert, and we've been there this summer, and turn up a rock and find in an arid wasteland some form of light. And we just can't conceive of the Creator putting in our own planetary system other planets revolving around our sun the same as ours does and not also make life available there. Mm -hmm. Ellery, at the, at the moment I'm a little speechless. I notice you are too. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Carr, when you fly to the moon next year, are you planning to stay there for some time or do you plan to come right back to Earth? 
No, we do not plan to land. Our flight plan, which we have furnished here in our literature, is a velocity that will take us to orbit around the moon five hours from departure from Space Maryland. We will not land on the moon, we do not think, on this first trip. Our planned flight is to immediately complete this orbit, which is a figure eight, so to speak, and return to the planet Earth. Our flight plan is 5,000 miles, first orbit around the Earth, 18,000 miles in the second orbit per hour, which will take us to the heavy side layer or the atmosphere. And the third orbit, approximately 1,000 miles out, will be 25,000 miles an hour at which time we will accelerate and fall towards the moon at 76,000 miles per hour. We will be out seven days, but our experience of flight will be approximately 10 hours. Mr. Carr, who is your navigator? Myself and Major Aho have already declared our intention of making this trip. We have not selected the third party. We will use conventional guidance systems, particularly inertial guidance and computers. And at Space Maryland, we hope by radar to keep in contact with space at all times until we reach the point where we're orbiting on the other side of the moon, at which time we will lose contact with our planet for a brief time. Are you planning to photograph the other side of the moon? Both sides. In, in other words, then, in, uh, in December of 1959, you should be back from the moon with, uh, at some point during that month. Uh, we can expect you back with photographs of the other side of the moon. Uh, exactly, and also we expect to carry a, an iconoscope camera, and it's a good possibility that we will be able to send messages direct to the Earth while we're in flight. How close to the, to the moon do you expect to get? Uh, our calculations bring us to within possibly uh, 20 miles of the surface. 20 miles of the surface? Right. That's rather uh, close. Yes, it is. Is there any danger of your crashing to the moon surface? None whatsoever. The velocity we have at the time that we are going around the other side of the moon will be approximately one half million miles per hour. Uh, Mr. Carr, I, I want to get back to something else at the moment. I have some of your literature here, and this, this is something that I hadn't seen. It relates to the Russian Sputnik. And I see here that you you uh, state that there is a possibility that the Russians used not a rocket system, but some kind of electromagnetic device for sending their satellite up. We feel it's possible that they used a different fuel system wherein they got aid from the electromagnetic field. Now, our experiments, which have been successful as relates to our particular craft, gravity and electromagnetism and electromotive force and the fact that we have been able to ionize particles in a magnetic field and as much as the Russians have a tremendously big betatron over there will accelerate particles up to billions of miles of velocity and uh, huge electromagnets it's very possible that they could have charged the outer shell of their rocket so that when the first blast fuel was used up, taking this craft into the ionosphere, it could very easily, the shell itself, become a, a disintegrating medium wherein repulsion would take place. And as the craft got lighter, it would be using fuel which was a part of itself. This would allow for the extra weight which they have accomplished. We know this is a fact. And surely the standard procedure of our rockets on step stages has proven 
that we can't duplicate it up until now. Well, I understand there are several American companies uh, developing a similar system right now for rocket re-entry as a means of overcoming the friction of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, system very similar, very much like what you are describing, employing the uh, forces of, uh, oh, it always gets my tongue twisted, magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, do you, do you uh, seriously think that the Russians did use this system to get their satellite up? It is quite possible because it is working with our system to this extent that we have a force field and no thermal problem. We can enter the Earth's atmosphere without any difficulty Mr. or leave it. I want to ask you one question which I don't know the answer to, <clears throat> and this is very serious. Have any of your flying saucers, or well, I'm, forgive me for using the term flying saucer, I know you call it a... Circular. I think it's necessary, though, to identify in the minds of our listeners what we're discussing. Uh, you prefer the, uh, the uh, phrase uh, circular foil? It is a round crane and very similar oh. to the observation of flying saucers. Have any of your circular foil craft actually flown? We At have had six, six successful flights with our own handmade models. Very successful, wherein every principle was checked out. We have fabricated here an exact replica of the model, which will be fabricated for flight testing and publicly made known publicly, and which will be able to leave our atmosphere if we wish it to. Uh, and orbit this planet. Mr. Carr, you have just stated that a certain number of your test devices did achieve flight. Absolutely. How far and how high did they go? We were using handmade models, and in each instance, they all of the material, the cost of it was, it was, was an exhaustion of funds, and we couldn't uh, afford long flights. So we used circuit breakers. In each instance, the flight was a minute, wherein we got the heights uh, well up over 1,000 feet, and oftentimes in their coming down, they didn't come straight down. They got caught with wind currents, and we trekked for two miles on many occasions. Five successful flights with the same model, which had to be rebuilt each time because it cracked up when it landed. What was the size of the, of the uh, model? The, the last one was six feet, wherein we put a leading edge around uh, six inches uh, of diameter greater than it was before. Uh, the, the, uh, the last model that we flew, six feet in diameter, handmade, believe me, all but the machine-made parts of the electromagnet and the accumulator. What was the weight of this? The mechanical parts in the model weighed a little over 16 pounds. Uh, the, the actual uh, frame of the model weighed 2 pounds and 7 ounces. Isn't the, that rather light for a six-foot It was. Device? It was built light. Believe me, it was built the same as a model airplane. Now, and the heaviest part about it was the, was the roller skate bearings, which we got for 19 cents, Union Hardware. I know those bearings. Right. Very good. They were our counter-rotating bearings. And the other material weighed approximately a little over 16 pounds. Now, we had a little electronic, so I got it from a model shop, the same as the boys use in model airplanes, a little timer, and this functioned beautifully with a couple of batteries. So that uh, uh, we had a system of remote control shutting on our power, which worked on the ground. But when this craft became airborne, my little system refused to work, and I lost this craft. It went out of sight. You mean it disappeared into it disappeared the atmosphere? It disappeared into the atmosphere. Going up or down? Going up. You mean it may be somewhere out near the moon now? No, it was too fragile. We were confident that it cracked up. We hoped that we'd find some reports about something being found. We never did. We carried an identification on it. I believe every word you say, Mr. Carr, 
but I am I am completely dumbfounded. I uh, I want to know when this device or this craft flew into the atmosphere, was its outer surface completely sealed off as a the way the wing of an airplane, or are there any open uh, vent areas for There's atmosphere plenty, to... Uh, plenty of open vent areas. The leading edge was approximately six inches in diameter, and we didn't take the bother to cover the rest of the surfaces. Did the uh, device rotate or spin? Absolutely. This is the principle. Counter-rotation uh, relative to the Earth's rotation in a magnetic field. This but, works. But, Mr. Carr, isn't it possible that you were relying on aerodynamics? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I agree with him. Was the outer surface a smooth surface of this, this uh, very similar, device? Very similar to the surface here. We used 64th inch balsa wood, covered it with silk screen and several coats of dope. And when this device started to spin, it went up into the air. It went up into the air and uh, out of sight. And not by, aer not by aerodynamic force. By gravity and electromagnetism and electromotive force. Interchangeable and operating in a field. Let me interrupt for just a moment to remind our listeners that this is WOR Radio, your station in New York, and this is Long John with the party line. And Mr. Carr... Without going into a commercial, I would appreciate it if you will answer a question for me. And the question, <laughs> namely, is this. Why did OTC Enterprises decide to offer to hobbyists and to model builders an opportunity to buy plans for the OTC X1 circular foil craft? We feel that this will help to accelerate interest in the proper way to enter into the space age. Our information, our tests, and our scientific knowledge, which has been verified, has proven to us that rockets are not the proper way for men to travel. Now, the model boys in the past years, believe me, experimented and built many of the wings that are on our airplanes today. I have seen swept wing airplanes in the early 30s built by model hobbyists that did not appear on on uh, commercial or aviation or military planes for 15 years later, but up here they did. Uh, when the hobbyists understand this principle and put it to work, believe me, the space age will be here. And this is what we are interested in. Now, we are making our plans known which is mean making them public. And that's what patent is, a Latin word, which means to make public. Well, Mr. Carr, uh, do you say then that if a person has these plans, that they can build a, a working model? If they will take these plans and faithfully follow them and build a wood mock-up, as we have done here, and understand these principles, they can then order machine-made parts, and when properly qualified to do so, they can build a model that will fly, not only in our atmosphere, but out of it. So what do you mean by when they are pop, uh, 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 properly qualified? This is an energy principle. It is electrical, and it is powerful. I'm at a loss for words at this point. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Carr, is this. If I have plans to build a model OTC X1 circular foil craft, and let us assume that I have the ability to build it according to specifications. I'm, I'm talking about a small one. Right. Will it fly? It will if it is properly built, and we give all the information. Well, then, why is it, Mr. Carr, that you haven't built one? We have built one. And we don't know where it is at the time. That's is that right. the one that's missing? That's the one that's missing. Well, what value would it be for me as a model builder to spend some two weeks, two months, or 
two years, I don't know how long it'll take me to build one of these, to build one when the inventor couldn't even get his back. I mean, I just don't want to, ha- for kicks, mm-hmm. build something and it, and it goes into space and I never see it again. We feel quite confident that uh, uh, the science has improved to a point where models can be reclaimed. Uh, at the time, we were experimenting. We were very happy that we had made a new discovery and knew that it worked. And we weren't very much interested in so much in reclaiming a model as we were to get it into the air. Now, uh, electronics has improved, control systems have improved, and magnetic shielding has improved to a point where flight models can be properly controlled. The improvements <clears throat> that you've just told us about, are these all listed in the... We give plan? all the information necessary for anybody to build a craft and fly it. Could I build a life-size model from those plans? Yes, indeed. Wouldn't it be advisable, and certainly, Mr. Carr, I don't want to be presumptuous and right. tell you what you should do with your business, but wouldn't it be uh, advisable for you to build one now that you... You know a little more about it to build uh, maybe a half a dozen working models? Very advisable. We have uh, a couple of high-priced engineers that are very busy. Doing what, sir? Building. Building models? Absolutely. Oh, how long do you think it would take the average uh, model maker to complete his model? That is a working model, not a... Uh, uh, a working model, uh, if he had to contract for machine-made parts, would be a matter of time and material. If we make parts available, and we may do it under proper qualifications, there has to be supervision under these things. Then, of course, assembly is a, a very short period of time, like assembling a good radio or something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, could I make all of the parts if I had a lathe? Uh, you would have to have uh, more than a lathe. A pretty qualified machine shop to finish all parts. Mm-hmm. Even for the model? That's right. Mm-hmm. That is for a working model, a power principle. But however, we have here an educational system of basics in this that anybody, any model maker, any hobbyist, hobbyist will be tremendously happy to fabricate this knowing that he is helping to make history because here by the time he gets it done and properly painted and seasoned and admires it we'll be out in the space in many instances you mean it would take him that long to make a, a not wooden necessarily model? no not a wooden but you're model. going to be leaving uh, the well we'll have of space December. flights before we go to the moon Mr. Carr, do you have problem of uh, gravitational pull against your body when you fly off in this saucer? Not at all. The force field here and the magnetic field that we're in and the gravity field which we set up makes us as comfortable inside our cabin as we are here in this room. Now, we are on a spaceship right now, planet Earth, and it is traveling at well over 66,000 miles per hour in its orbit around the sun. We are comfortable. And why are we? It's because we have a force field. The force field is the ionosphere, the heavy side layer, the electrical aura around the Earth, which keeps us here in comfort instead of being picked here for it. With this block. How about the air supply when you fly off to the moon? We will have to carry it with us. Ours will be a sealed creature comfort cabin. Uh, cabin, and we expect to employ the best engineers in the industry to make sure that it's properly built. Are you, do you have any plans for using green plants or algae? To no, you not in this to first brand. Our craft will be a Model T. We can't go in for such refinement. We just hope we don't have to get out and crank it. Well, what would happen if you did the picture? <laughs> <laughs> right, in, right in the middle of a lunar, inside a lunar crater, cranking up the saucer. Well, it it will run. Your saucer does seem to have a cup on top of it, sort of. Mm-hmm. Is that where the crew is going to be? Can you put that together again, Mr. Colton, please? 
We can yes, assemble that place. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think the listeners are quite aware of the fact that we have a, a model of a flying saucer in the studio, which which looks absolutely fabulous. It's silver with a blue edge. And Mr. Colton is putting it together. He has a top of the saucer, which is a sort of an inverted dish, a silver dish. And I think it's about how, what diameter is this uh, model? 24 inches. 24 inches. It looks this a little more than that. The scale of the kit plans are identical <clears throat> like this. And it has a sort of a tripod uh, foot effect, sort of like three knuckles on the bottom on which the thing rests. What well, were those... Uh, uh, that's a landing gear, isn't I it? I guess uh, that is, is that, that's the landing that's gear. That's the landing gear, and now the equivalent of the cup is going into the saucer. Well, isn't that where the, the crew would be housed on top there? No, the crew are housed in this area where you see the sunlighted portholes. I see. Mm-hmm. And down even into the body of the saucer itself. Will the will the dome... Uh, this is for uh, observation. In other words, uh, the, the uh, crew can come up into that dome. Well, the, in this model, the OTCX-1, which will be 45 feet in diameter, this cabin, uh, total diameter of it will be 15 feet. So there would not be room for uh, the crew to completely rest up there. This is a place for observation uh, and instruments, particularly our telescope camera, uh, telescope, and things of this nature, will be used... Uh, to explore further out from where we are uh, as relates to our horizontal position. Won't, won't there be rather a great danger of intense sunburns in that observation dome? Uh, there is uh, great dangers all the time. We expect that our test research hangar at Space Maryland to uh, explore these dangers and try to shield against them to the best of our ability. How many windows are there in the device? We plan to have six portholes. And what will be the size of these portholes? You will will be looking out of these portholes while you're flying around uh, the room. Yes, but we can shield them also. We will have uh, shielding away from uh, radiation coming through them, and uh, some of them we'll use for observation. we uh, will certainly use uh, an awful lot of electronic equipment for uh, guidance and so forth from our landing gear, which is at the bottom of the craft, and also cameras from our landing gear at the bottom of it. Mr. Carr, are you planning to take along any defensive weapons in case you are attacked in outer space? No. We, to begin with, we do not expect to be attacked. Number two, our force field... Uh, will protect us to a great extent. This this craft glows. The electromagnetic ionized field around this craft in our atmosphere and right through the ionosphere will shine and glow like a well like a fluorescent light, particularly at night. Now this field will disperse most all particles, small meteorites, uh, much of the radiation, and we will be protected uh, insofar. As being attacked is concerned, not from anything from this planet are we worried about. Because we have maneuverability, we can change our orbit any time we want to, and any missile would be a sitting duck to us. Well, uh, the Russians may have a lunar moon probe going or a satellite going around the moon at the time that you were up there, and there is even the possibility that you might crash into the Russian a uh, moon satellite. No, we'll, we will not crash into anything. Our, our instruments and our force field will protect us at all times and guide us automatically away from crashing into any large object. Well, what is the reason that you won't land on the moon this time? Uh, we don't have time to prepare for it. Uh, the one thing about the moon, we don't know what's up there. This is the first thing. Uh, the most powerful telescope only gets us within about 500 miles of the surface. And you're we going to be 20 miles. That's right. We can conjecture a lot about the moon, but until we actually get there, we do not know. Now, the conjectural part of it and preparing against it would take up too much time for this first voyage. That's why we do not plan to land. However, 
Maybe this space station's already up there on the other side. Maybe we'll be invited to land. Well, what are you referring to? There is a possibility. Now, whose space station will be there? Could be from Mars, Venus, Jupiter. You mean uh, a uh, space station of another world? Right, another uh, another planet. Another planet. Right. Uh, having established a space station around the moon. Very possible. And uh, you may you may sort of pay a friendly visit. You may talk we to may one another. We may be invited. You may be invited. Or escorted. Is there any indication that this may happen? I mean, have you had any kind of communication implying such a possibility? We know this, that there is space travel already. This we know. Not by Earthmen. Apparently not. But you don't, do you know, do you have any indication from where this other space travel is? No, we haven't. In our experiments, which incidentally we started on the exploration of this development all the way back in 1925, right here in New York City, it took many years to come up with the basic principles. But when we had completed them, believe it or not, we saw electrified craft in the air. We had five sightings, and we are a trained observer... And this is no accident. And what year was that? This was in 1951 and 52. I see. Mr. Carr, I, I, for my own satisfaction, I'd like to ask you if you are familiar with the work of Mr. Uh, John Warrell Keeley. Uh, it's been brought to our attention several times, but we have uh, not followed anywhere in his path. Uh, are you familiar with the methods that he used? Not too much. We understand something about uh, natural magnets uh, having their potential accelerated by multiplicity, but we don't work in this field. Well, I, I had the pleasure of studying one of Mr. Keeley's machines. Mm -hmm. It was a very beautifully made device, and I believe it was made before ni the year 1900. And he, right. he did achieve flight with his device. And it did have, have a revolving spherical rather than a saucer-shaped uh, unit. And I know that he, w he was proposing to use these uh, spherical units to take people around New York City instead of the old-fashioned elevator trains. And uh, I was very curious. I wanted to know whether the basic principle that you were using was a development in the same direction. We're not familiar with what Mr. Keeley's done only by reference that has been brought to our attention orally. Uh, unquestionably, if he was using a magnetic field, he was on the right track. Well, there was a question of harmonics. Is there any element of, of harmonic um, vibration involved in your device? Uh, we don't have much about um, uh, sonics and harmonics. So far as we know, it is not used, or at least we don't, if the principles are being applied, we are not aware of. We are using electromotive force, gravity, electromagnetism, and space itself as a catalyst. Do you incidentally make use of magnetic explosions? I wouldn't call them explosions. What happens here is that we have 12 releases with every uh, as pulsating uh, on and off current with every rotation of this craft. This, this when it accelerates up to a rather high rotational velocity, sets up a field which is in a sense like a sine wave. It is somewhat like alternating uh, current uh, that uh, used with phase uh, uh, multiple phase motors. Now that, that's very clear so far. Right now, what we have added here are mutually conducting capacitor plates, which, to our knowledge, have not been used in this sense before by anybody. These plates, which become charged in this field and release their charge, release it into the entire outer shell of our craft, thereby setting up this force field which makes it possible for us not to worry about a thermal barrier because we are practically traveling in our own vacuum. What kinds of control devices do you have? Is there an instrument panel from which you... Uh, yes. Now, this regulate is circuit the... breaking, rheostats, uh, uh, regulators, and all of the standard electrical equipment. We have a rather unique control 
panel which has for each electromagnet where the circuit is first made and where the power system begins, we have one control for that. So that our control panel here consists of, yeah, of a circle of 12 of these controls. Now, bisecting this by uh, horizontal and vertical line, we can go in any direction by changing this field. As these magnet, uh, magnets go through this field, by reducing them, we go in this direction. Can you, uh, with this, I don't like to call it a flying machine, although it is a flying machine, and it, it is, is a machine. It's a spaceship. It's a machine, and it flies, and it can fly into outer space, and you are going to fly to the moon with this machine. Can this machine hover in the air in a stationary manner, the way a helicopter does? Yes, indeed. When, when we reach the relative rotation of the Earth, well, and this is uh, strictly by diameter, by the size of our planet in diameter rather than by mass and weight, when we reach this relative rotation, we become airborne, uh, absolutely weightless as regards the Earth. Now, if we keep this at an equal, we'll just stand still. When we accelerate, we start to move. I feel as though I'm flying to the moon right now. It is this near. And I want to be a want to be one of your first passengers, Mr. Carr. We're confident that by the time that we take off, a little over a year from now, the thousands of people on this planet will be perfectly conscious of the fact that the electromagnetic gravity, electromotive force machine is a reality and as the space age is here. What kind of comforts do you have in this machine that you are going to use? Well, outside the atmosphere, naturally, we will have to keep this a sealed cabin. Our problem is very similar to the cabin in the submarine. Just reverse it a little bit. There they have tremendous pressure. Here we have the absence of pressure. So we have to try to maintain a comfortable 1G of gravity plus a uh, reasonable atmospheric pressure where breathing will be normal and comfortable. Do you have uh, couches or beds for sleeping in on your trip? We are going to have fold-away cots. Uh, my uh, secretary uh, of our corporation, Mrs. Hildegard Shea, is also a designer, college training, and she's been working on fold-away design for this cabin. Mr. Carr, I have a couple questions that uh, I've uh, wanted to ask you for, for a few months now. Actually, since the last time we met at uh, in Lebanon, New Jersey. Uh, I have uh, talked with uh, a number of people on the party line, and I have always been very grateful that they've been kind enough to appear, such as Dan Fry. Uh, George Van Tassel, and many others. I could spend maybe 30 minutes just mentioning the names of different people. Uh, again, I repeat, I'm very grateful that these men have been kind enough to appear on the party line. My question is this. Why do you, Otis T. Carr, President of OTC Enterprises Incorporated, Incorporated of Baltimore, Maryland, bother to appear at these so-called space conventions. Of course, you could throw the question back to me, and before you do, I'll answer it. I go there as a reporter. Why do you go there, sir, and lecture? Well... There is a certain amount of identification here and a certain amount of high interest. I myself... I'm glad you used that word, identification. Are you identifying yourself, sir, with the Dan Fry's and the George Van Tassel? Uh, I would say with Mr. Dan Fry, whom we have met, that he is a qualified engineer and scientist, and I believe that his book, The Steps to the Stars, has verified our principle, although I didn't know it was written at the time we started with And therefore, you see, you feel that it's advisable for you 
as the president of this corporation, a corporation that's planning to take off at 12.01 a.m. on the 7th day of December, 1959. And you intend to take off at that time and on that day to uh, go to the moon, is that right? And you yes. feel that you should be at the spacecraft convention? I again. think it's wonderful to be invited, which is what has happened. We have found these people to be sincere. We have found most of them to be extremely courteous and have a higher consciousness in many respects. They have witnessed, they have seen craft, they are uh, doctors, they are lawyers, they are scientists. May I, may I interrupt you for a moment to tell me the name of one medical doctor, one attorney, one scientist that has actually seen a, a flying saucer? Uh, I, I am very hard at remembering names. I believe that we have in our files of letters in Baltimore, which uh, incidentally come from as far away as South Africa, men of practically every title now at um, uh, of science who have uh, verified or seen what they could not explain in uh, as being made by man here on this planet. Or they have known people who they believe their veracity. Therefore, uh, we will take, uh, uh, well, we can take the example of Major Aho, who was a combat intelligence officer in World War II, and he's uh, honorably retired. Uh, this man has had sufficient training of observation. When the Major tells me that he saw a fast land, I believe him. When I myself have seen them at high velocity in the air, I believe myself. Uh, the, we have and can verify that there are doctors, lawyers, and believe me, in Oklahoma City, the largest television station there, as a, uh, uh, one of the most popular programs in the state, and the moderator of this program, the man in charge of it, like you, Long John, has also seen a spacecraft himself. We were on the program for approximately one hour on television live, and we accepted telephone calls after a certain amount of demonstration of our model and our flight plan. In this call, and we should have in our records uh, this man's name, uh, he, uh, he uh, identified himself as a Ph.D. physicist, a man who had taught physics in the state of Oklahoma, and who was a qualified electronic engineer. He volunteered to be the third passenger on our flight, which was quite heavy scientific evaluation. Let's get back with our guests again. <coughs> you, uh, you've just given us uh, your opinion about Major Wayne A. Hall. Uh, I'll go out on record in saying that I think this is a very pleasant man to know, very considerate man, sensitive individual. But the fact that he was a major, the fact that he was an intelligence officer, does not necessarily mean that the man has uh, knowledge of, uh, of space or spacecraft or anything like that. Why are you so sold uh, on this man? Uh, the, uh, the only thing is this, that we feel that uh, a man of such character would not say that he saw a craft land if he didn't see it land. Uh, we find him dedicated in this work to trying to bring into the consciousness of people that the space age is already here. Uh, we are very happy to appear on a, on a speaker's platform with him at any time. We find him living the kind of life that he is trying to tell others about. And uh, uh, he's a man that we just uh, admire. Now, uh, uh, if 
I had not myself seen face grass. Then maybe there would be doubt. But we're nice to nice to have someone else verify these mm-hmm. things. Mr. Carr, uh, if we can set aside the fact that you uh, feel that you're a scientist and an inventor, and I'm not denying that, I'm not in a position to judge, frankly. But if we can set that side, uh, set that aside for a moment. As the president of a corporation, I think that you should also be a good, shrewd, keen businessman. And please don't think that uh, I'm implying that you're not. I do not know. But I would say this, that listening to you uh, during the past couple of minutes, I would be a little skeptical of your business ability when you're telling me that this man is a fine man, a clean living man, he is conscious of space and what it means and all, this sounds like a lot of nonsense when it comes to, you know, down to business. Well, I don't see anything nonsensical about it at all, John. Uh, We're living in a rather strange age, believe me. Why do you uh, say it's strange? Why I'll do you put you this what, label on well, it, Mr. I can put it on here because it's the first time in recorded history, the age that we're living in, which is just like this one. When a balance is struck in nature, any movement or any action always sets up a counterbalance. And man has found out how to totally destroy himself. This, a balance has been struck. We have now stockpiled on this planet Earth total destruction so that there would be no animal, vegetable, or insect life left in a very few days if it was ever let loose. Now, this makes a little bit different type of age than other ages. This makes a a time when man has to start moving in other directions. And some men have dedicated themselves to this. That's why we did not join the military with the OTCX-1. It is purely a spacecraft, something to bring a higher consciousness into people's minds. Is it possible that the military didn't join OTC? Well, I I wouldn't say that. We were invited. What do you mean by being invited, Mr. Carr? We were invited by the Air Research and Development Command, and we decided to go on our peaceful way. I have in front of me information bulletin number three, dated December 23rd, 1957. This is on the OTC Enterprises Incorporated letterhead of Baltimore 18, Maryland. Car's principles of free energy space flight accorded. Highest scientific verification. And I'll read the first paragraph. Otis T. Carr, president of OTC Enterprises in Baltimore and inventor of a manned spacecraft, which he is offered to build and deliver to the government without one penny of risk to the American taxpayer, publicly revealed the propulsion principle of his spacecraft in the following statement. Now, I'm not going to read the entire statement, but I would like to ask you this, sir. Where would you get the money to build this? Because if my memory is correct, The last time we discussed this, I had a a release, or a prospectus, I guess it would be labeled, from OTC Enterprises, offering to build the OTC circular foil spacecraft for $20 million, and an additional one could be built at the same time if somebody placed an order for two, 
the additional one would cost $4 million. You may be a very wealthy man, sir. Your corporation may be extremely wealthy, but are you in a position to invest $20 million to build this and to deliver it to the government of the United States without one penny of risk to the American taxpayer? From government funds, yes. We have not asked for government funds. Uh, the problem of the money is not great at all, John. When the Pioneer rocket was fired a few weeks ago, uh, and it was quite a flight, about 70-some thousand miles up, there was just about, on uh, the North American continent, about $19 billion price tag behind it. That is the missile and guided missile and research and all the refinements up to this point run around 19 billion. Now, a billion dollars is a thousand million. And you take 19,000 million and you compare this with 20 million, so we shouldn't have too much difficulty. This is a small drop in a mighty big bucket. Well, maybe I didn't read this first, but maybe I haven't analyzed the first paragraph. Are you suggesting in this first paragraph to the reader that you are willing to build this craft without charging the government for it until after it was delivered and checked out? Then well, then, in other words, pay for it. would you start to build it now, Mr. Carr, and after it's completed, hope that the government would be interested in it? Not at all. We'll invite them uh, to view our craft when it takes off. If they have interest, this will be wonderful. But it is uh, truly a, uh, a space craft and not a military vehicle in any sense of the word. Are the rockets military? Well, we are we are trying to get we, to the moon? We don't know. I, I, I'll tell you one thing. I think it's very foolish to shoot at something that you haven't explored at. We may get 20 rockets back. In other words, you think that there, that uh, there's a possibility that people are living on the moon, and they may become a, a little irritated because you know somebody's we shooting rockets up. A Japanese scientist said that uh, it'd be quite a laugh if we exploded a hydrogen warhead on the moon, but it'd be a much bigger laugh if we got 20 hydrogen warheads back. Uh, now, if uh, Columbus had asked Isabella to her jewels and say, I want to build the world's biggest cannon so I can shoot around it, maybe this North American continent would not have been discovered. Uh, the way to explore is to go there. Mr. Carr, didn't you say earlier when I asked you whether you were taking along any defensive weapons that you, didn't you say that you didn't expect any dangerous people up at the moon? No, but if I start shooting at them, that may be different. Well, how are they going to know that you don't have uh, evil intentions when you arrive at the moon? Uh, maybe they're mind readers. I mean, you don't know this for sure. I don't know at all. It's I don't a risk. Know it is. In other words, this is a risk you are taking. Yes, that's right. And, uh, and we're what? going into unexplored regions. We oh, don't know and, uh, supposing the American government's experimental moon probe uh, succeeds before your, uh, your takeoff time arrives, would you... Uh, Go ahead in any case. Oh, yes. We just hope that they don't contaminate the area that we'll be around. Was that a snide remark or was that I a don't technical know. remark? Technical. Believe <laughs> <laughs> uh, me, this is way out way uh, Let uh, me ask you another question, uh, Mr. Carr. Uh, I'm under the impression that you have no intention of building this craft and then delivering it to the United States government and saying, fellas, if you want to buy it, it'll cost you $20 million. If not, uh, forget the whole deal. It's not going to work out that way. But you do intend to build one so that you can go to the moon with Wayne Aholt. On and the seventh day of December, and another, pa another passenger. We just invited him. He's no. going with us. Isn't Mr. Colton going along? Uh, he'll be there in spirit, if not otherwise. Uh, however, in these lectures, there was always a question and answer period, and one of the boys, uh, 
I haven't even got a chance to get my question in, so you can't answer mine yet. Could I ask the question? Yes, please. The question is this. Where do you intend to get $20 million to build it so that Major Aho and Otis T. Carr can go to the moon? We're interested in introducing the space age, and there's thousands of people on this planet that are also interested in it. Uh, there has been talk, conversation, and uh, ballyhoo back and forth. We are doing something about it. Uh, from Iceland, from New Zealand, from Australia, from uh, Berlin, Austria, and even behind the Iron Curtain has come well wishes and bon voyage. Can you build with well wishes? I mean, can you go to the, to the supply house and say, give me... 400 pounds of aluminum, and I'll give you 400 well wishes? We will say this, that uh, that when your motive is right and you can prove your principles to be sound, in this free enterprise system in America, God-given, man has always been able to succeed. We have not worried too much about the need for money, the ideas of how to raise it will be available when we are ready for it. Are you, aren't you ready now, sir? We're working very hard. I mean, because if you're... How long will it take to build this thing? Uh, approximately three months after we get our space hangar completed. Uh, it will take about three months to build the craft and about three months to check it out. <laughs> well, we're off to the moon tonight. I... I uh... Aren't you, I'd like to get two little technical questions in there, Mr. Carr. One is, uh, I'll tell you the two of them, and then you can answer them both, both together. One is, where is the power, where does this uh, flying saucer, I'd, li I'd prefer to use that. I know you don't like the term, but it's much simpler for me to say flying saucer rather than circular foil uh, spacecraft. Uh, how is your flying saucer powered? What is the source of its power? Do you have this to do you have to buy fuel? And the second question is, how, what is the highest speed that you uh, estimate it will achieve? Uh, both good questions. The first one is why we are in business. Why the OCCX one will take off as we have scheduled. This is that we have a central power package, the Utron Electrical Accumulator. And this is the real novelty of the beginning of the development of this whole system. It is electromotive force from within, stored the same manner in which a storage back, uh, battery stores it. The difference is that it is a piece of moving machinery and a part of the whole mechanism. Now, uh, you can uh, consider a storage back battery in your car. It is inanimate. It sits there, and electromotive force is conducted from it and returned to it. Assume that this battery was a piece of machinery in motion in your car, and you begin to understand some of our principles. The first successful automobiles were electrical and had the inventors at this time found out what we know now, the electric automobile would be the greatest thing on Earth. There are still some electric automobiles running around New York City. But they're, I'll guarantee you that their battery is not a piece of machinery in motion as a part of it. Well, uh, do you have to sto uh, get uh, electricity stored up into the yes, atom please. in the cross? We start out by storing this electricity electrochemically the same through electrolytic action, the same as is any other dry cell or any wet cell. Is that what you did in the model that disappeared? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carr, supposing Henry Ford came to you, and he said, Otis, I know that you've got some money, and I'd like, I'd like to have you invested in a new idea that I have. It's a, it's a craft to go to the planet Venus. And you find that he has with him a gentleman who claims that he is receiving 
telepathic communication during the time that Mr. Henry Ford is in your office. And the man also tells you, said, Mr. Carr, one of you be kind enough to wait a moment. I want to check before you invest your money on the landing possibilities. I'm going to actually project myself to Venus. And he sits in the chair in your office, and it appears that he's in a trance state. And about ten minutes later, he's wide awake out of the trance state, and he tells you that everything will be all right to land there. Now, Henry Ford, at this point, says to you, Otis, you want to put the $50,000 into the deal. In other words, you have confidence in Henry Ford. I think we all do. But wouldn't you sort of question Mr. Ford? Well, I'll assure you, that associates, there, there aren't any tactics like this being used at OTC Enterprises. Well, isn't it true, sir? And I, I have no reason to... Uh, in other words, I, I don't want to knock anybody. I don't want to be unkind to anybody. But uh, do you honestly think that the mystic barber has been to the moon? We don't know. We never met him. Oh, well, yes, you did, sir. Please. You, you talked with the mystic barber? Did I? Yes. Well, you were in a rather lengthy conversation. Maybe you know him as Andy Sinatra. This is the possible. man who has a band on his head and claims that he's receiving communications from other planets. You met him at a convention. We well, both I met him at the convention. Several hundred people there, John, and I don't remember him at all. You were unimpressed, sir. I don't say this. I just do not remember him. <clears throat> well, I don't know. I, I, that brings me, me back to the, the aspect of the question I asked you a little earlier, Mr. Carr. Uh, this man who uses, uh, who goes by astral projection to the moon, I don't know how long it takes him to get to the moon by that technique and whether it takes him five minutes or five, uh, about five hours or what. But uh, what I was asking you before was what is the fastest that your flying saucer can go? Between here and the moon on this orbit, uh, on this planned flight, our last two hours of flight will be 76,000 miles per hour until... We get on the other, uh, start to go around the moon, and then, believe it or not, our velocity will be comparable to the total distance covered, which was approximately 500,000 miles per hour. 500,000 miles per That's hour. Right. For a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, do you have a theoretical limit as to the highest speed that this, this flying force no, can achieve? No, uh, the, the, the highest velocities or something that will be a matter of exploration. We feel in space there is a possibility to exceed uh, even the velocities that are the standards of the electromagnetic wave now, uh, the so-called velocity of light. Do you think you will be able to go faster than Absolutely. light? Absolutely. I think so, because uh, light as we, not faster than light, but light as we have evaluated the speed for the past few years. Well, this would mean then, uh, Mr. Carr, this, this, is, this is news. I mean, this is important news that you are announcing at this right. moment. I don't know if the public is aware of the importance of what you have just stated, but this would mean that we would be able to visit not only the planets, but the stars. Other galaxies. This is the most interesting part. We certainly hope that uh, in this moment of transition that we go through between here and the moon that we will have gained sufficient new stability that on our return we can plan flights to other planets and from other planets to other galaxies in our lifetime. Won't this mean that uh, you will have to have rather large ships which will have large atmospheres inside because, I mean, this, I, I can't, even at uh, uh, double the speed of light, it's still going to take you quite a uh, long time to get to the stars. Uh... Well, distances are relative, relative to resistances. Now, when we remove resistance, uh, distance then is something that we don't know very much about. Um, there is a possibility that, after all, man invented time. 
And there is a possibility that I, we have outmoded our invention. Uh, the velocities are relative to the attraction. Uh, when, uh, and we have stated that space itself is a catalyst, and the forces that we use are gravity and electromagnetism, mm -hmm. and that they are interchangeable. Very beautifully put. Now, we can take a, um, a rubber band, and it is a rubber band, and it is two inches long, and we can stretch it four feet. It is still a rubber band. Uh, but its its condition in space has changed. Uh, now, why? By pressure and by energy. Now, on our first program with Long John, and I believe that even uh, that you visited here on this first program, there was considerable discussion about me questioning our accepted constant of the velocity of light. Uh, we have felt for a long time, and our experiments have led us to believe that this is a man-made evaluation and that the inventions that we built are built around our evaluation rather than to be the total truth. We noticed now, released about uh, two or three weeks ago, that the Nobel Prize is considered being given to some Russians who have proven that even in our own atmosphere, there is a higher velocity than the velocity of light. That is very interesting. Now uh, that you bring up that question, Mr. Carr, do you think that the Russians are working on a device similar to yours? Uh, if they're interested in space travel, they, they should be working on it. Uh, we have not tried to conceal these basic principles. Uh, man uh, doesn't own... Um, the law of displacement, anybody can build boats. Here is a basic law, another unit of law, another step in a ladder of our consciousness. I don't want to control it, and therefore we have not tried to conceal the released information that tells exactly how our craft works. Therefore, the Russians must know. Now, if they have anybody over there with any curiosity, they can build one real fast. Is it conceivable that they have already built a flying saucer similar to yours? Very possible, and I don't see why one hasn't been built here on the North American continent. Well, is it even conceivable that the Russians may be on the moon right now and not be telling us about it? Um, well, we don't hear much about their rockets anymore. Uh, we've heard an awful lot about rockets, but now you never hear one release about a rocket from Russia. Well, what does this mean? I mean, you're, means, you're giving us a puzzling face. Well, well frankly, hard. I do not think that they have stopped when they already showed initiative. Well, what, do you, what are you meaning? I mean, you're, you're giving us a puzzle. What, is the, what are you implying? Is, I, I do not know. What are the possibilities? The then? possibilities are that they have spacecraft. Out at the moon, for example? Could be. Do you think that, uh, Mr. Carr, do you honestly think that people are living on the moon? I, I'm not talking about people from this planet that may uh, I would have say there. make a wonderful space platform for somebody coming from another planet. Now, if I lived on Mars and wanted to do a little bit of exploring of the Earth, I don't know of a better place to hide myself than on the moon. To hide? Yes, if I wanted to, get on the other side to conceal and not uh, let too much be known. Uh, and uh, knowing that it couldn't be observed from uh, our planet, that's a good... Uh, if you could get from Mars to the moon, which is certainly easy with our craft, we expect to make it from a, at a velocity of about a, a million miles an hour between the moon and Mars when we make the second trip. Uh... Once they have got there, I don't see why they wouldn't use the moon as a station. I think uh, you told us one time, Mr. Carr, Mr. possibly Mr. Colton told us this, that uh, it would take you five and a half hours to get, uh, uh, yes, five and a half hours to get to the moon. The return trip would be approximately five hours. Do you still think no, it's it, it run approximately the same both ways, about five hours each way as we see it. Give or uh, take a few minutes. Yes, and uh, incidentally, though, John, we'll be out seven days, according to Earth. You'll be out 
You mean in the craft in space? That's right. Well, I, I don't quite follow this. If it takes five hours, what are you doing? What are you, is this sort of well, a... Well, during this time, I'll only eat one meal because I'll only have the sensation of being away ten hours, but I'll really be away seven days, and this tummy ought to go down a whole lot. Do you think it's a wonderful work? diet? If you're away seven days, you will only uh, require one meal. Apparently. According to my calculations, this will be correct. Will you have to have any vitamins? Uh, maybe if we have a... I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get into a commercial. <laughs> but it is an ideal time, and so I will take advantage of it. Right. Let's get back to this trip. I wonder... Well, I, I imagine that certainly you, you uh, have uh, thought about this uh, for possibly many days. Uh, <coughs> can you describe to us, Mr. Carr... What the takeoff will be like? Will there be a launching pad or anything like that? And when you actually get into space, what will it feel like? I wonder if you can describe that to us. At Space Maryland, where we will build our space research hangar, this craft will be assembled inside this dome building, which, uh, well, Looks somewhat like a, just half an egg. There will be a hydraulic lift from the cellar of this, which will be, uh, which will be the same diameter as our craft. This hydraulic lift will be used to bring the craft up to the ground level, where we will here test out our relative rotation principles our magnetic field principles inside the sealed building, uh, then we will slowly drop the lift and we will have our craft levitate right inside this building and go through the test experiences of what we expect to find in space. Uh, it, as you see by the model, has a landing gear that makes it possible to be uh, 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 moved on the ground without our principal in full operation, and we will open this uh, at the ground level and bring this craft out on the landing strip, which is uh, just a small area. We do not need any uh, takeoff uh, uh, distance area because we go straight up. Uh, when we activate our craft, it's uh, 45 feet diameter and it's RPM that is revolutions per minute will be approximately 580 this outer shell as you see the model now, this doesn't sound like very many RPMs but consider a merry ground going at 580 turns a minute and will give you some idea of the great amount of energy that is being expended here and manifesting. Uh, and as you'll notice by the model, our cabin is stationary. All this is whirling around us. The force field then builds up. We are then protected. We have our own little world, our own little planet, and we will start to rise gently at first, and we will accelerate. But regardless of what velocity we go, we will still be just as comfortable as we are sitting here in this room, even though we are going straight up. When we have reached a height that's uh, above commercial craft or above any possibility of causing consternation in forward flight, we will start in a forward velocity around the planet at 5,000 miles per hour in our atmosphere. Uh, the, there isn't very much stress on the metals. We only have one center axis in this craft, as our model plans show, and which can be proven by demonstration. Uh, when the force field is built up, this encloses us inside here. All the metals and everything, just like a shell, encloses an egg. We are protected. Uh, we then can go at velocities higher than 5,000. 
But I'm considering what I know about materials and the stresses and strains on them, assuming that we were have going to have more than I know we will have. And I've made a conservative estimate, estimate of 5,000. Now, my flight plan will be patterned accordingly, and that's exactly the first uh, orbit around the Earth. That's what the velocity will be. Uh, we don't expect to have much sensation except one of uh, considerable exhilaration that success is here and we're on our way. Um, observation, our knowledge of speed will purely be by optical observation of things that we see. So when we start getting outside the uh, atmosphere of the Earth, uh, all we will see is this planet getting a little bit smaller. And this is going to be a beautiful sight. And as we go farther, we're going to see that this magnificent planet of ours is a jewel. It sparkles. It has the brilliance of rubies and diamonds and emeralds. And why man tries to contaminate it, we will never know. We also expect to see it turning. And this is worth the trip. We expect to see it slow revolving. And we expect to feel like we're really what God intended to be one of the true creatures. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Cox. Sounded like a cooking tour there for a moment, didn't it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carr, have you gotten clearance from CAB? Uh, we were asked this question in one of our lectures. We found out that there's no law in the land that can keep you from going straight up on your own property. Interesting. Wow. Wow. Boy, that was very good. Wow. <laughs> That's a wow. very, very good answer. I'm sorry. I mean, that, that's, that's this. I mean, uh, I mean, even an, 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 an elevator operator doesn't need CAB care and Uh, I just thought, And he said to me, John, we have orders for over 40,000 sets. In our first print order, we uh, ordered just 10,000, and uh, the orders started to flow in. That, uh, turned around and we're having them uh, produced through a different printing process so that we can uh, be able to handle an anticipated uh, 75,000, which they imagine that many people will be interested in the plan. Ellery, I think you had a question for Mr. Colton. Yes, yes I do. Mr. Colton, uh, a little earlier, Mr. Carl was referring to the entire subject of other magnetic fields. And what I wanted to ask you was, in these other magnetic fields, do, does the magnet that we normally use in this magnetic field that where we happen to look, does the air magnet get into work? Does it get a response in these other magnetic fields? Are you equipped to answer that? Probably not, but I'll do my best with it. Words like magnetism and gravity and light and a lot of others. The meanings for them are only expressed in nature itself and are always relative to the uh, natural movement of the physical material bodies and energies in nature. <clears throat> so that actually, while we've talked a great deal about them, about these forces, and we have established certain constants and so-called laws. Uh, we have to remember, as Mr. Carr says so often, that we have the uh, frailty of being the observer, and we ourselves are in motion in this motion field, and so we aren't at all sure of the constancy of any of our observations because all of our measuring devices and our yardsticks are merely extensions of our own senses. Well, I, I gather that you, you did say that this was not within your domain, this answer as to what happens in other magnetic fields. 
I don't think it is. No. Yes, but then I would ask you a very pertinent question, Mr. Colton. How come you are not part of the crew of this first flying saucer to take off for the moon? Well, because a large part of the navigation and observation, communication, guidance, and control will be from the planet Earth. There will be a system of geometric triangulation by the use of familiar devices such as telescopes, cameras, radar and radio beams, and so forth. And my job in connection with the shakedowns and the first actual manned orbit of the moon will be at the Space Research Institute in the Electronics Building, uh, more or less of a supervisory capacity to see that everybody doing the right job at the right time with the navigational and guidance instruments that will be uh, part of the uh, flight guidance system. Well, then you are part of it. It would be part of the ground crew, in effect, and the tracking crew. crew. Right. And uh, are you using similar systems of tracking to those that are being used to follow the satellites? The Fortunately, the yes. Uh, all of the systems that will be needed as guidance and control for our shakedown and actual main orbit conventional here and are commercially available. Now, Mr. Uh, Norton, I'm sorry, Colton, your first name is Norton, and uh, forgive me, it's, I keep thinking of you as somebody. All right. Norman Evans Colton, Director of Sales Engineering of OTC. Now we've got it straight. So, Mr. Colton, uh, a little earlier, Mr. Carr referred to the, uh, to a possibility of having received some communication from people from other planets. Do you have any information about that? I myself have not received such information, but uh, I've had so many revelations of all kinds in the past few years that I certainly wouldn't doubt such a statement, and uh, I especially wouldn't doubt it if uh, Mr. Carr made it flatly as a statement of fact, because he has certainly uh, shown many qualifications and abilities in developing these uh, energy and propulsion systems, which are far beyond what we consider as the conventional. And uh, I also noticed that uh, one of the major best known of the so-called top three electrical manufacturing and engineering companies of this country has announced that it has established officially a department for developing communication by brainwave or telepathy or whatever term you choose to give it. Now that you've brought up that subject, I, uh, I just want to cut in for one moment and then please continue. I want to know, uh, are you equipping your uh, flying force with cybernetic devices? As I understand the meaning of the term, there will be many cybernetic devices used both on the craft and in the electronics building at Space Maryland. May I... Uh Digital computers uh, and semantics uh, and the correlators and other uh, such devices. I wanted to recommend a, a, a fellow pilot or a co-pilot for your craft, uh, Mr. Esquist, who is quite competent, and I think he'll do very well when you get on the other side of the moon. But uh, to get back to the um, my line of questioning, we, we got lost in the other magnetic fields, and then we, we've gotten back into these controls. I doubt, Ellery, if we'll ever get lost in a magnetic field as long as we have good instruments, because one thing we do know... Oh, you always put the answer some, something about them. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. We have learned that the uh, energy activities <clears throat> of the magnetic fields, or whatever you call them by some other name, gravity fields or electric fields of this universe, uh, the one thing we've learned is that their behavior is constant in relation to the motions of the bodies, oh, the that, planets and moons. Uh, in you the state this as a fact? I state it as a conclusion from all of my 
observation of the uh, natural philosophers since they began to write for our history. Mr. Colton, were you present when the model flying saucer, and again, I ask your, your forgiveness, I prefer to use the term flying saucer, your other phrase is a little too tongue-twisting for me, and you'll just have to indulge me and let me use that term. Uh, well, it's a if you good object, idea. I will stop, but I no. prefer to use the term Not flying saucer. Not at all. Saucer. Every time you use the term flying saucer, I use the term electrogravitational spacecraft, or circular foil craft, and then by connotation, the correct technical term will eventually replace the better name. Mr. Dixon, were you present when the experimental flight that Mr. Carr referred to took place? No, I wasn't. Well, these experiments were conducted, <clears throat> and Mr. Carr was satisfied with uh, the successful accomplishment of this type of flight sometime before I met him about two years ago. I see. Mr. Carr, did this model that you had, model flying saucer, develop a flowing color around it when it went off into the atmosphere? No, it didn't, because it did not have enough of the external matter to do this. However, in laboratory experiments, we further bore this out and know it to be correct. About the glowing color that That's uh, right. accompanies the craft. Absolutely. We have seen it. And uh, in reference to Mr. Colton's, uh, who uh, is a man of high integrity, believe me, we've been associated with him for a couple of years, and we know. He is satisfied when an independent firm, technically qualified to do so, put in writing and verified our principle as being sound and correct. I have a couple of telegrams here. Uh, as you know, Mr. Carr, Mr. Colton, you're familiar with the fact that when we receive telegrams, we read them, some of them are a little rough. <coughs> well, we take the rough with the smooth. Good. Now, uh, here's one here. Uh, this came in by telephone. I, I don't know. I, I wish that people, when they listen, that they would be kind enough to put the word wax in the address. This gentleman who sent the telegram... Uh, Evidently just sent it to 1440 Broadway, W-O-R, and so the Western Union office downstairs, they were kind enough to call us into it. A man by the name of Don Dunn. Oh, yes, Mr. Dunn is with one of the TV journals. This is a question for you, Mr. Carr. When on program last June, you promised a 20-foot flying model would land on White House lawn within three months. That was six months ago. What happened? Don Dunn. I don't recall stating a 20-foot model. I said, I do recall saying that we could build a 45-foot craft in three months if we had all facilities available. Uh, we can still do it if we had all the facilities, which includes a considerable amount of manpower and cooperation. Uh, there have been other delays which have been natural and unavoidable. But we are moving fast, and that's why we have set this date for departure, which is now just a little more than a year away. It can be met. It is not an easy date for us. We could relax, show to the world these principles, which will be shown long before we take off, and uh, have a good time. But uh, we have found in by past experience that when we have set a specific time, declared it, and worked towards it, oftentimes we succeed. Uh, we made no specific statement of date on when we would deliver a craft to the White House, House lawn. Had we made this date and had they allowed us to do so, I think we would have met it.